You're listening to the Apple Insider Podcast. Welcome back, my friends. Welcome back, everybody. I'm William Gallagher, and joining me is the inestimable Victor Marks. Does that mean I'm the one who gets to talk about Qualcomm a lot? Because I could probably do that quite quickly. Yes. Hello. Sounds like you, man. Go for it. Right. Qualcomm did a thing. Isn't it? God. Yeah. Any other news? Nope. All right. Well, this has been the Apple Insider podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Um, okay. I think Qualcomm is a somewhat larger topic than that, but I also know that you're the one who knows all about it. So tell me, isn't it just boils down to uh, Qualcomm 1, Intel 0? Yes, but what's Apple's score in that? Well, uh, 6 billion or something. I don't know. Uh, I lost track of what the latest figure they're supposed to not be... Um, telling us about so so let's let's talk through a little bit of history here right previously on qualcomm yes previously on qualcomm insider the the thing of it was that qualcomm was sure that they were not getting enough royalty payments they weren't getting enough money per phone they weren't getting enough they weren't they weren't getting money they felt they were owed and apple for their part felt like they were paying plenty They'd paid enough. Sure, it was, and and so in some views, you know, one perspective of this is that Qualcomm. There's a, a concept called FRAND when it comes to licensing patents, nice. and the the definition of this is that it's a a fair, reasonable, and non discriminatory term. That is that that the license should be fair that it should be a reasonable amount of money and it shouldn't be used as a as a club against a person that you don't want to license to that, that you have to license fairly and reasonably and, and you know equitably to all parties that want to license okay. and that term is specifically applied when you're talking about licensing uh, a patent that is is something that only that company has a hold on right you you, you they they have the monopoly on it, and so they're allowed to reap the rewards of having that monopoly. But in exchange for that, they have to license it at a reasonable cost, and they can't pick and choose who gets to license it because they can't make and choose the winners and monopolies down the road. Does nice. that make sense? Totally. Yeah. That's yeah. that's at least the basic principle of this thing. And so Apple's position was that these were not friend terms. That that this didn't make sense. That they were getting beaten up for more license fees. That they felt they paid. To right. be clear, and Qualcomm for their part didn't think that they were being paid and thought that they were doing things just fine. And Qualcomm went around the world and tried to get injunctions to say, you can't sell iPhones here. And they tried it in in, uh, China. And they tried it in Germany. And they tried it in America. And these cases worked out with varying degrees of success in different parts of the world. And basically, you know, they had to, to pull iPhone 7 and iPhone 8 from some markets temporarily. Or, you know, and, and different judges decided different ways. But this was going to be coming an all-consuming mess. Yes. Now, why would Qualcomm do such a thing? Money. Okay. But as a part of money, I think another reason that I was looking for was the the idea of Qualcomm's future. Oh, okay. Because if, if yeah. Qualcomm one, – one outcome that we discussed in the past was that – these patents could become invalidated, in which case the, the 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 property inside them would have to be given to Intel and MediaTek and others who could make just as good cell modems, and that would ruin Qualcomm's business in the future. Another outcome would have been that those guys would have been able to make 5G modems anyway, just following the standards, not using Qualcomm's IP, and in the process, Qualcomm would have all of Apple's business to lose. Right. Okay, and, so instead of a previously, we've actually got a next time on Qualcomm. That's the real well, issue. Okay. Not, not exactly, but you know these these are the the alternate futures, alternate universes, if you will. And so these are the different kinds of outcomes that could have been seen. And we saw this play out before, right? The uh, the graphics company that had the graphics chip for iPhone that basically went under when Apple said, you know what, we're going to make our own. I don't remember that stuff. Who was that company? Do you remember? Uh, I feel like it was imagination. Right. Okay. Well, that wasn't very nice of Apple then, but okay, I understand that. Uh, yeah. So that was Power VR Imagination Technologies, and so uh, Power VR was a division of Imagination, 
and they used the power VR chip in in a lot of iPhones from the very beginning. And when Apple said, you know what, we're going to make our own, all that business went away. Yeah. It was not a good situation to be in if you were a power VR employee. No. 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 Because who else are you going to sell to? Well, you could sell to, um, gosh, Android phone makers, except Qualcomm supplies to them as well. You could go into the furniture retail business. You could. Yeah. So your options yeah. are not unlimited, but uh, yeah. Well. But not amazing either. No. 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 So what happened with Qualcomm? What 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 was the uh, upshot of all of this? Because they were coming to uh, – this was beginning to come to an actual trial. Yes. Was it hours away from it or most days? But Something like that. It was really down to the wire here. So what happened with, with just days to go to the trial, let's say? What took place, William? Right, I thought you were going to tell me. Uh, Apple caved. Is that... Did they? Did they, though? Apple ends up paying Qualcomm when they didn't want to. Yes, I'll go along with caved. I'm sure well, now, I can get the reasons, but... I, I'm, a, I'm going to characterize this slightly differently. So, Apple never objected to paying. Apple objected to paying unfair and unreasonable amounts. Okay. All right. And so rather than go to trial and bear this thing out and pay the lawyers lots of money, the, a settlement was reached between Apple and Qualcomm to end all these lawsuits. Yes. Simultaneously. Yes. Oh, I see. I know where you're going with this. You're thinking those poor lawyers. They were gearing up. They had all this work ahead of them. And now Apple's gone and taken it away. Apple's got a bit of a track record now, hasn't it? I mean, how... how... As, as your attorney... How can I possibly afford my, my second boat if you're going to go ahead and make, reach these settlements? Okay, that's a very cynical attitude of the entire legal system. I'm not disagreeing. I'm just <laughs> saying. Okay, harsh, possibly fair. Okay. Um, right. So, on Tuesday, Apple and Qualcomm prematurely ended the patent licensing trial by announcing a settlement where Apple would pay an undisclosed amount to Qualcomm and a range of patent licensing agreement. Now, this is – is um, Qualcomm has not really said how much they'll be earning, aside from anticipating an additional $2 per share EPD for the next quarter. The UBS analysts that we're looking at here suggest the amount of Apple will be paying for device is about $9 per device. Right. And so you're so saying this is, unless we know what they were originally going to be paid, we can't work out whether Apple has won or lost here. Well, I mean, mixed, right? So previously, they were paying an assumed $5 per device. Oh, I didn't so know that. Right. Okay. $9 is more. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right? This is my level Sub here. Substantially $9 more. $9 is more than 5 Okay. Yes. I'm coping but, with this bit. <laughs> yeah. hold, hold up your hands and on, on one hand, up, hold up 5 Now add four more to it. Yes, it's more, right? Almost double. Do I count thumbs? Uh you may count thumbs for this exercise. Thank you. Okay, so there you go. <laughs> now, Apple's obviously lost. Not necessarily because the, the, there are a couple of questions. One is, would they have had to pay more had they gone to trial? Okay. Right. Right. Could could that have outcome have been worse? Right. right. What if the judge said, well, it looks to us like 12 is the right number. Would you rather pay 12 or 9? Uh, can I use my feet? No. Uh, Okay, now, well, the other possibility, and, I, and that 12 is a made-up number, but it's just the sake of, of illustration here. The other thing is that in all of the testimony that we have from Apple throughout all of this, Apple always said, look, we would rather buy from, Sam from Qualcomm. We would rather absolutely use the Qualcomm part. They didn't want to sell it to us. Now, this works out because one of the things that we've been talking about as past rumors was how there was not going to be a 5G iPhone in 2019. This year, yeah. Yeah. So the the thing of it is, is Apple going to be able to have a 5G iPhone for 2020? Well, if they're able to buy from Qualcomm, it looks like yes. 
This is why I said right at the top that it's Qualcomm 1, uh, Intel nil, uh, because presumably, uh, I mean, I hear these stories that this is actually, if Apple could have got the stuff from Intel, then they would have gone to trial. I know nobody knows, but this is a, a theory, and you agree with that? You think it's need well, for the future supporting, that's driven it? Supporting that, right? Intel has completely ended their 5G modem for smartphones program. Oh, no. They, they really, just shut off that, that division. Oh yeah, is that as in about an hour after this announcement? Or? Pretty much. Okay. They they saw that they said, you know what, we are not going to develop five G modems for mobile. We're going to continue to do it for IoT and PC devices, but that's it. So Apple has done a graphics card company out of something. It's done the lawyers out of the money, and there are Intel employees now who are one imagines wondering about their jobs. They're, Apple's not very nice this year, is it? Well, you say that, but in separate news, Tim Cook committed Apple to donating money to rebuild the uh, the, the Notre Dame. Okay, good point. Right. So tell me again how they're not nice. Uh, by doing people out of jobs, taking contracts, doing things like this. I mean, let's just litter this with I, it, allegedly. Right. But, it's, you know. I, I'm being silly by conflating the two. I know that. But it's it's just that there's well, a lot going you know, on all actually, around here. So You say that about being silly, but I was thinking about this with Qualcomm uh, stuff. And you can make a very um, cold argument that this is business and that Apple knows. However it worked out, Apple is probably better off than it thinks it might have been under any other circumstances. It's chosen to do this, but they've really been in a spat for a long time over this. And there's got to be something personal in this as well. You can see it can stick in the jaw, uh, having to pay uh, Qualcomm for something they think that perhaps they shouldn't have to. You can well, see so that it's personal as well as business. Every decision is real. Really. First of all, the personal thing is is the part where Apple is still arranging, as far as we can tell, to hire people in San Diego, where Qualcomm's headquarters is, in order to make their own 5G modems. Oh, well, there you go. It's job creation. Yeah. So there's still that. Right. At the same time, Huawei's CEO said that, of course, they're very receptive to selling 5G chips to Apple. So... Yes, I actually wrote a news story for Apple Insider about that, and I thought that was very interesting, that interview. Um, the only thing is, that's literally all he said. It was like half a sentence long. And then the next day, somebody else from Huawei was saying, well, we haven't actually talked to Apple yet. Then, of course not. But you yeah. know what? That's all you need is to make the opener. And right? they, possibly uh, not be in the middle of accusations of cloning Apple gear or allegedly um, that too, all, the, although, all these other things with the feds. Yeah. But it's it's not the first time that Apple has been involved with a supplier and competitor in, in Samsung, for example. Oh, sure. I mean, I know this from my other work in, in drama. You, you can be suing a company that you're currently working with as well on totally different projects and occasionally actually it works out to your benefit. But, you know, yes, different arms, different pockets, different hands. Right. But that was quite poetic. The, the there, Huawei it? CEO <laughs> making that overture is enough to start meetings happening. And without that kind of overture, it can be difficult to start those meetings sometimes. So you're picturing somebody at Intel, they had this sandwich out, they saw the CNBC interview and thought, oh, forget this. Where's the beer? Well, I think that didn't matter as much to Intel as the Qualcomm decision and settlement because that, that really sealed the fate of it. Okay. So next time on Intel. Intel, Intel is still doing great business selling CPUs to, to Apple. <laughs> right. Um, if you'd said that to me a little while ago, I would have said yes, but there are rumours that Apple will move off. Uh, I actually read a piece about how, when Apple has moved between processes, and it is stunning how similar the situation Apple now is to when it moved before. Uh, I now, I do believe uh, that the move is going to happen quite soon. Oh, and the convincer for me was a story that apparently even people in Intel are telling people Apple are going to move. So, uh, yeah, they're not going to have that business for a great deal longer, one imagines. Well, so let's let's think about it like this, right? They moved away from the 68,000 processors to PowerPC because it was inevitable. It was, it was simply that they were not able to get anything more out of that processor. Additionally, mm -hmm. that move happened more or less around the time that – Steve Jobs came back. He'd just come from Next, where they had been on the 68,000 processor and had ported to Intel. 
and we're running OpenStep on the next step on Intel processors. Right. I remember Jobs saying, because I've watched the video recently, that he was not around uh, when they made the move uh, at Apple. But according to everything I know, they did a great job then, uh, was the line. Uh, right. Said, and so. and that's sh- but that did. shift had happened just as he was doing the same kind of shift at Next. Oh, I see. I didn't understand that. Yeah. yeah. Right. And... You know, they, they came back and struggled to get uh, System 8 running on Power C, PowerPC properly. They did. That, that was one of the first challenges that Jobs had when he came back. And then they were using Motorola PowerPC processors. They sourced IBM PowerPC because Motorola couldn't keep up and couldn't increase speeds when they promised to. Mm-hmm. Right? That's when we started seeing the, the G4 was still a Motorola processor because they held the patents on that. And then the uh, the G3 was also sourced from IBM. Yeah. IBM got the G5 contract and IBM completely and utterly failed to follow through on their promise for a mobile G5 processor. And that was what sealed the fate of that that allowed the switch to Intel to take place. Right. So the question is, are we seeing that now with Intel not managing to keep up their promises? Uh, in my experience and my very specific knowledge of this, yes. In your broader, more detailed one, no. This is like the Simpsons line, isn't it? That wonderful line in the Simpsons. Uh, short answer, yes, with a but. Long answer, no, with an if. Yeah. Right. I was. I was just thinking of uh, a Simpsons quote about a beverage being the cause of and solution to all of our problems. Is it Muller Light by any chance? Oh dear, I hope not. It would be duff if it were in the uh, Simpsons. Okay, right. We've managed to throw <laughs> in cartoons and politics all in the same time. Perhaps we should well, go back to... Well, to be fair, they threw politics into the cartoons first. Now... No, I was... Uh, I mean, it's my British <laughs> accent on Muller, but okay. Um, as we're recording this, the... Uh, Miller report. The report. The report. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, the the, oh, is finally out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So where do we stand then? What happens next? Everything's happy. We get iPhones with five G in it in June, July, something like that. I don't know. Well, so first of all, I think that with the higher ASP that Apple has made for the the phones, as we've seen, all of the phone costs have drifted upwards. They can probably absorb. The, the additional license fee per iPhone without necessarily raising price on us again. I'm hopeful that's the case. We will find out when they launch the next phones if they're going to go ahead and do that or not. But in some ways, this is good. First of all, the Intel modems always had difficulty in terms of, of being as competent as the Qualcomm modems. The Intel modems did not uh, transfer data as fast as the, the comparable Qualcomm 4G modems. So that's good news. But I, I, you know, it's going to be another four years before those are completely out of the supply chain, before they're stopped being sold, before, you know, they're going to have to continue to support both modems in yeah. iOS. So there's that. It's going to be around for a while to come. Okay. And of course, we're going to go ahead and see a 2019 iPhone launch. And what are people going to say about it? Do you know? Uh, that it doesn't have 5G. Well, there's that. What else? Uh, it's expensive. Yes. Uh, that they want one. Speaking from it the It doesn't heart, have though. a folding screen. Oh, no okay. folding screen. Yeah. Don't you I'm... know? Don't you know over there that all of the coolest phones have folding screens? I think you mean both of the coolest phones. But okay. Yes. Whatever. <laughs> I want a folding screen. I want one that uh, yeah folds more, but and it works and and runs iOS. But you know, yeah. Might be being okay. picky there. Okay. So, Samsung, who just got done with the Galaxy Note that exploded. I honestly can't remember how long ago that was now. But uh, it was like a Note go. Seven. It was. I think it was Note Seven, wasn't We're it? We're on the tens now, are we? Uh, I think. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yep. So. Yeah. So okay. by just getting done, I mean I have a long memory. But <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes. So we just got over those, and now. They've launched the Samsung Galaxy Fold. Yes. And these things sell for $2,000. Yeah, that's like Apple prices. Yeah. And when unfolded, it turns into this sort of in-between kind of size tablet, which is kind of cool, although it doesn't really have Android tuned for tablet for that. So it's it's sort of something that's kind of waiting for software to catch up. But 
all of the press people that they issued them to, yes, and by all I'm exaggerating, by many of the press people that they issued them to, they broke within like two days. What did they do to them? Well, in some cases, nothing. In in a couple of cases, it looked like they had a screen protector on the thing, and so the, the press people tried to peel the screen protector. And in mm. fact, it was a top layer of the screen that peeled off. Ouch. Oops. Ow. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, in okay. another example, one of the, the people used a little bit of uh, modeling clay to prop the phone up. And apparently some of that modeling clay may have worked its way into the hinge and broken the whole thing. Wow. Now, they use the modeling clay to prop the phone up for photography purposes, which they do with every single mobile phone they get. This is a normal thing. And by the way, if a small little piece of modeling clay works its way into the hinge, what's that say for like pocket lint? Uh, point uh, that it welcomes pocket lint and uh, is a friend to pocket lint. OK, I didn't know that modeling clay was used for that bit. That makes sense. OK, uh, but hang on. If these but press... still relatively normal things to do, right? If these are press ones, then are they not early releases? So you'd expect not absolutely final off the production line things. I don't know, but isn't that possible? You you would expect that if they were press ones, that they would have been tested and verified and QC'd before sending them out to press to avoid this very kind of problem. Okay. Right? One would hope. Um, right? You more often hear of things being rigged. Uh, to look better in reviews, like um, uh, specification benchmark testing things, rather than duff ones off the sh sh store shelf. But OK. I mean, if Apple did this, uh, I would be wondering how many there were and how it had happened. And it'd be bad, but I don't think it would be dreadful. I mean, we're not saying that uh, Samsung's things are unbuyable, are we? Is that a word? Okay. No, but, but what I'd like to say is that this comes in close succession after we just discussed the keyboard issue that Apple has with oh, true. the yeah. butterfly keyboard. And Apple's statement was to the effect that there were a small number of users that were having issues with the MacBook keyboard and that it was a, a device that had shipped successfully to tens of millions of users and, and stuff like that, right? It was It was yeah. a very small problem perspective. Samsung's official statement minimizes this as being a few reports from a limited number of Galaxy Fold samples. Right. I see a uh, very similar language there. Um, but you're waiting for me to point out that uh, as the percentage of total people having these things, it's somewhat larger than Apple's example. Hmm? So here, here's what I think. I think that Samsung should try and do interesting things, right? I, I think that we push the envelope by trying. However, they knew ahead of time that this thing was not going to work. If it failed in this many reviewers' hands, and there are a number, right. they knew before they shipped it that this could happen. And in light of this happening, they have the choice to say, you know what? We see that there's a problem and we're going to hold off shipping this thing until we resolve it. And then they can go ahead and take their time and relaunch it when they're ready. That's not what they're doing. Nope, we're shipping. Go ahead and buy them. 2000 bucks, please. Everyone line up. That's what they want. And I think that, that I sort of give them faint applause for trying to push things forward by doing something that, that Apple isn't doing, that few others are doing. But... At the same time, you got to know when to, well, at the when risk of, of, yeah, yeah, you have to know when to hold them. Exactly. You have to know when to fold them. You have to know when to walk away. Seriously, we should work for Samsung or somebody's marketing company. We were you right have to know there when to that. run. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can stop now. Uh, oh. uh, what's, what's the <laughs> other company that came out with the phone? Uh, I can't, I keep getting a mix up in my head. Which way around does Samsung fold? So it folds the hinge inwards, and there's the other one yes. that, that folds yeah. out. There's another the one other that folds one back across nicer, the spine. I think. I mean, I haven't seen either of them actually in the flesh, but the uh, wrap around foldy outy one looks nice. Well, so I mean, it's me. it's and th this one folds like a book and folds in. The contents are in. The other one folds back across its spine, 
which gives you the effect of having a regularly sized phone that's a little thick. And you can look at that screen. And then when you need to unfold, now you've got double the screen. For the Samsung Galaxy Fold, you just have to open the book. Okay. Interesting. Which is, is more difference. like a flip phone in a way and sort of less useful to me. But Oh, flip phones. I remember them so well. Yeah. I know. Okay. Um, I take it the other ones aren't. I'm sorry that I've blanked on who makes the other ones. That's awful of me. But they're not out uh, yet. Uh, so we don't know if they're likely to have similar issues. Samsung is first again. First in fire, first in fold, first in failure. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Anyway. But I have I have important news about this. I think it's related. I'm drawing a connection that isn't exactly there, but I'm I think this is important. Okay. In Texas, Apple has opened a recycling lab. Right. And I think this is ideal because Apple is expanding the recycling programs. They're quadrupling the number of places in the United States that a phone can be accepted for recycling, things like this. They're going to use their recovery lab and material recovery lab in Texas to find ways to improve the environmental efforts in the future. Cool. Now, they, they of course, intend for these to be things for recycling iPhones with the, the robots that can disassemble them and so forth. Daisy, but yeah. I think I think that's where these folding phones should go. Right, so all five of them should make their way to Texas. Okay. Well, 10 or more that were at least broken, but yeah. Anyway, the Apple robots that they use, uh, so they've had a number of different robots for disassembling old phones. Currently, the one that we know about is called Daisy, and Daisy is capable of disassembling 1.2 million devices per year and can disassemble 15 iPhone models at a rate of 200 units per hour. When they say disassemble... How how low level does this get? Every single component out there on the table being looked at or just... Well, yeah. so uh, think about it, right? Discrete components means separating out screens from boards, from circuit cards, from batteries, and so forth. And, you know, you can recycle all of the screws. You can recycle the aluminum shells. You can recycle... Uh, you can recycle cobalt... And so they they can actually recover the cobalt and mix that back in to produce new Apple batteries. Wow. Okay. The aluminum recovered from the Apple trade-in program gets reused for the MacBook Air enclosures because they already use 100% recycled aluminum in the construction of the MacBook Air and Mac Mini enclosures. Right. That's very good. That's very impressive. It really is. You know, there's there's a lot of concern about mining and having to mine for new materials, mining for lithium, mining for cobalt, mining for gold, for the, the connectors, and being able to reclaim that. It does have an energy cost, but is outweighed by the energy cost required for more mining. I saw a video recently about um, tin foil, how that was made. And I watch all this mining, all this incredible machinery, and I think my sandwiches are not worth it, you know? I'll just I'll put them in a paper bag. Or, thanks. or you know, paper, right? You could use paper and then recycle that paper as opposed to trashing it. Or okay. at least the paper will degrade faster than your tin foil. Okay. Right? There are all kinds of things you could think about, William, and I appreciate you thinking about them. Okay, I feel the weight of the world's responsibility for recycling on my shoulders, but I can handle it. Yes. Okay. Uh, so Texas is being recycled. That sounds good. Um, <laughs> Mm, yeah, Texas itself is being recycled. Very, very good. Um, we ought to talk a moment about Captera, you know? Yeah. I think we should. Captera is this uh, sort of app store that helps you find incredibly cool apps to try and, and you know optimize your business. It's really hard to choose software. How do you choose software? How do you decide what you're going to use? Me personally, absolutely. It takes yes, a very you. long time and I try lots of things. Uh, but I often find that, I mean, because I'm not, yes, I'm in a position where I do love using software and I enjoy exploring new stuff, but I still I have work to do. Uh, I'm a writer and a script writer. Uh, I can't be piddling about with alternatives to final draft just because they're alternatives to final draft. I have to get the scripts written. So there comes a point where I find something that's at least good enough, hopefully fantastic, but then I will stop and carry carry on using it. So I am missing out on things because there's just so much, isn't there? Do you read reviews? Uh, yeah, I even, I've even i written a few. 
for time I know. show. Great excuse for me to discover the best tools for me. I secretly there, love I mean, that. there are people I imagine that, that write reviews but don't read anyone else's, and so I was wondering if you actually read Oh, I see what you mean. Oh, no, absolutely. Yes. Uh, I mean, there are some... Uh, I'm thinking there's some fantastic reviewers out there, and I've just... Black. So, Ser- um, Serenity Caldwell, when she was writing, she's with Apple now. I've forgotten who she was with before, but her pieces, I mean, especially when she did video stuff. Yeah, how could you not uh, yeah. love her stuff? Yeah. Right. So, Captera, it has this store, has this app store that has thousands of software reviews available to read. And it makes it easier. You know, there, there are over 750,000 reviews of products from real software users. So you can discover everything you need to make an informed decision. And there are more than 700 specific categories of software. So it should be easy to find the right software for your business. And you can read these reviews at captera.com slash Apple Insider. Now, it's, it's easy to say, well, you know, that's not relatable. Well, I don't have that problem. But I, I can think of easily times in, in my past in different careers where I had to find stuff like this and I really didn't have a good resource for finding stuff like this. Uh, an example that come, came up for me was that um, at, at each company that I've worked for going back until about 2006, I have had to implement a customer support contact Great. management and ticket system, I'm right? So we, sorry. You know, we, we sold products and we got emails and historically every time i arrived at a company they were just using outlook and everyone answering the support inbox and there was no tracking of what the replies had been and no tracking of a case history and no no concept of a support ticket so there was no track no record of of what contact had been had with this customer and who'd said what it was just like each email was a new email which is bizarre when you think of it right and so at, at one of them, we implemented a thing called TTS or trouble tracking or uh, ticket trouble system or something like that. And at the next one, I got us a subscription to Zendesk and we used Zendesk for a while. And in both cases, I didn't really know how to find the right kind of product or, or see what reviews were for each of these things. It was just kind of a shot in the dark. Right. And – that's where captera.com makes a difference is that you can go ahead and search and see the reviews and see people's experiences and see the list in that category. So it's not such as just hunting and what do people use and asking around for personal recommendations. It's you get to see a greater amount of exposure and decide faster. And being able to decide faster and pick a good product goes a long way because otherwise it takes all the risk out of it. Well, I think uh, people – Unless until you start doing what you do and are looking, one doesn't appreciate that there's more to software than a feature list. You can look at a list of things it's supposed to do, and that doesn't tell you whether it does it the way that you like. Whereas I, uh, reviews uh, from people actually using them uh, clearly do. Absolutely. So you can visit captera.com slash Apple Insider for free today to find the tools to make an informed software decision for your business. captera.com slash Apple Insider. captera, that's C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash Apple Insider. captera, software selection simplified. I always feel like I'm on here as a sort of stand-in for Mike because he obviously knows all these things that I don't. But um, recently I was talking with him and we realised between us, uh, whenever there's a problem we're both trying to solve, invariably I come up with a software solution to it and he comes up with a hardware one to it. I find that just fascinating. <laughs> it both works, but we, yeah, we come from such different areas. It really interests me. Well, and the thing of it is that a hardware solution isn't exactly a, a full hardware solution anymore either because hardware tends to run firmware and firmware is software. Sure. But I will so, automate the hell out of something with keyboard maestro and he'll just plug in a new drive somewhere. But yes. you you are an automation savant. You really are. I mean, you've you've got uh, keyboard maestro, you've got yeah. automator, you've got FileMaker Pro, you've got folder actions. You've got all kinds of things. And and honestly, it to me, it feels like a spider web made of string and sealing wax. That works. Uh, if I set out to buy all of these things in one go, I mean, uh, actually, it wouldn't have been that expensive. But what it would have been was overwhelming. So I remember buying Keyboard Maestro 
10, possibly a long many years ago, um, to do a particular thing. And it did that. And I'm still learning what it can do because it can do so many things. And it just, it's grown and I've grown along with it a bit. And then Hazel, I got for something else. And then suddenly you realize that Hazel combines with that, combines with this. And also just your Mac without any other tools. Um, your Mac will uh, automate certain things. Uh, there's a thing I don't like. Uh, I love uh, Pixelmator Pro on the Mac. I prefer it to Adobe uh, Photoshop for most of what I do. But there's a, a, a missing button uh, for a particular thing. So I just told the Mac when I press this keystroke, click that button. And one of them's through the Mac and one of them is actually through Keyboard Maestro. Because Keyboard Maestro is this astounding thing of it looks on the screen for a button that looks like whatever you've told it is and it will click it if it finds it. So, uh, yes, you can go crazy on this. Uh, and why wouldn't you? There you go. And it's interesting that you mentioned Pixelmator Pro because I'm still on the original Pixelmator. I never got the Pro version of that. Uh, for and the I've Mac. begun working... Yeah, for Mac. All right, because I, I, uh, I've just started using Pixelmator Photo on iPad, but up till last week, I've been using the old Pixelmator on iPad. And, Pro, and, and I think they're both very good, so... Yeah. Well, I've been using Affinity Photo and been very happy, actually. Oh, you must tell me about that sometime. Andrew O'Hara on Apple Insider is a big fan of that. And I, I've now got it, but I, I've hardly ever used it. Well, I'm a huge fan of Affinity Designer and uh, Affinity Publisher. Affinity Publisher is in beta. It's sort of a replacement for Quark or InDesign. Um, Affinity Designer is Illustrator-like. It's vector art. And I'm really pleased with Designer. I, I've been doing more vector art than I have in 20 years, just right. because it's so cool. Don't you try to take Adobe InDesign away from me. Love that app. I loved Adobe InDesign in its early days when it was in version 2 through 4. Um, gosh, anymore, I am, I'm kind of off of it, but Publisher is really working well for me. Cool. Yep. Now, talking about iPhones, because we were talking about iPhones a minute ago. We were talking about recycling them. Yeah. Well, Ming-Chi Kuo has a note for the 2019 iPhone, and he's predicting that it's going to have triple lens cameras. You're going to have a super wide lens. You're going to have an improved selfie camera on the front face. It's, it's You're going to have that sort of square arrangement that we were talking about where you get three lenses and a flash on the back. Yeah. So Actually, he I predicts, don't want a better selfie camera. I, I prefer the lower res blurry one, but that could yeah. be an age thing. Yeah. Okay. So uh, he says that. Looks... He says that we can expect these cameras on the the 6.5 inch OLED, the 5.0 inch OLED, and the 6.1 inch LCDs will upgrade to the triple camera. Okay. And a super wide camera from Sony will be added to it. That's that's the specific change here. Uh, Sorry, super will wide be, from Sony. So Sony will provide yeah, the lenses, or for the additional super wide lens. There, yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, all three new models will likely upgrade to twelve megapixels versus the seven megapixels that we currently have. Okay. Any word on iPads? N no. Oh, okay. I was uh, filling out an insurance form uh, recently and yeah, I happened to do this thing of how much it would cost to replace something. So I looked for the nearest equivalent uh, of my main iPad. I have an iPad uh, Pro 12.9 inch, the original one from what, 2015 or so. And I remember yep. it cost £800 or something, more than I could realistically afford, but absolutely worth it when I had it. And uh, to get even the equivalent in storage, I'm over a thousand pounds now from the new ones. So, yep. yeah, and actually, I really want one of the new ones, but I'm holding out for next year, uh, partly because of, you know, it's a thousand pounds, but also because I still think we're going to get OLED screens on the iPads next. I, I see it coming. Mm. That's my prediction. I'm unconvinced at this moment. And, and Alcoa also comments that we're going to see lightning continue on the iPhone range for the foreseeable future, that uh, there there is not going to be a shift to USB-C across the line. Okay. USB-C remains an iPad Pro feature, Lightning for oh, everything else. Oh, did you see that thing that Craig Federici uh, said recently that there will be more video features coming to the USB-C things? I believe in the current iPad Pros. Uh, I don't know what they would be, but, you know, things are happening there. Yes, they are. Speaking about things happening, I want to talk about your friend and mine, Facebook. Okay. When did Facebook become my friend? Facebook's always been our friend. It's a friend to all of us in need. Yeah. 
a friend to all mankind. Pretty Wouldn't much. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, yes. Okay, so way back in May 2016, they, they did a change where they asked some users for their email and email password as a way of authenticating them. Right, hang on. Isn't that the one thing? Every bank, every site says we will never ask you for. Uh, but Facebook did. And I take it some people said, oh, go on then. Here's my password and username and credit card number. Right. So when, when opening a new account, Facebook requested some users provide an email and password to verify their identity when opening a new account, which is, as you say, a very bad idea. But these users did it because it was the only way to open a new account for those those users. They were asked to do it, and you couldn't okay. go past it. Upon entering the information, Facebook automatically imported contacts that were stored on that email provider's Ouch. server. Right. Okay. Okay. Which means that Facebook logged into these customers' email accounts and pulled the contact information from them and stored that data without even asking. Well, it's looking after it for us. Yeah. Okay. I, I, you know, you know how in every vampire story ever written, the vampire has to be invited in. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. this. Well, I look at it as um, <laughs> Facebook asked nicely, and some people agreed. So let's just, you know, let's put it out there. But um, no, no, Facebook asked to authenticate them. Facebook didn't say, we're going to log into your stuff and take all your contact so, information. Victor, I don't even know why they I bring this it. up now, but what's your email address and password? It's William at AppleInsider.com. Okay, it's worth a shot. We're back to that then. Okay. Oh, hang on. I'm in. Okay. Right. I've always wanted Woo-hoo! to say that. Okay. I'm hacked myself. Uh, oh. You are a I, hacker. I have even less money than I realized. That turned sour suddenly. Okay. Uh, so what's happened since then? Uh, did Facebook confess so, this? Or? So Facebook, Facebook apologizes. <laughs> okay. They said that this is a legacy of a bygone user authentication feature that was meant to allow users to verify their identity and upload email contacts all in one go to the network. It wasn't really meant to be this way. It's accidental. And by the way, only 1.5 million users were impacted. Okay. Right. I'm not hearing real remorse there, but... uh... Well, allow me to read their statement exactly. Last month, we stopped offering email password verification as an option for people verifying their account when signing up for Facebook for the first time, a spokesperson said. When we looked into the steps people were going through to verify their accounts, we found that in some cases, people's email contacts were also unintentionally uploaded to Facebook when they created the account. People just slipped uh, uh, and fell over. Yeah, We, we have... We have fixed the underlying issue and are notifying people whose contacts were imported. People can also review and manage the contacts they share with Facebook in their settings. I'm wondering whether Facebook is one of those apps that tries to get you to add all your contacts, the way I think LinkedIn does, or something like that. And I, I always resist this, but uh, apparently here I could resist all yeah. I like. It was happening anyway. Okay. Yes. Delete Facebook. Mm, harder than you think. We, we've we've covered we've covered this in the past. We've posted articles on deleting Facebook. I wrote an article about how to minimize your history exposure to Facebook by deleting all of your history, so that you know you weren't exposed in that regard. Um, there are other things you can do, like like I used to run extensions in my browser that would block the news feeds so that I was only seeing the groups that I was involved in. Limit limit your exposure to Facebook. Facebook are not your friends. Facebook are not responsible. Every time they've been caught, we've written a story. And every time we've written a story, it's always been, uh, this this unintentionally happened. Manage your stuff in settings. Never mind that they obfuscate the settings. Oh, yes. Every time you look, every time you make a change, the settings are different. Privacy is more and more hidden because they're doing you the favor of taking away your privacy. The thing that used to kill me is – Forget uh, it. I, 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 I don't hear a lot of people complaining about this, so I don't know if it's a fluke in my system, but I loathe the sounds that Facebook makes uh, when things pop up, when you send things, when just life is going by. So I find the place in settings, this obscure place, and I switch off all sounds. And a few weeks later, it switches them back on for me because obviously Facebook knows better. And I, it's long enough that yes. I've forgotten where it is and I have to go hunting again. I wrote myself a little paper trail once of how to do it. You need to automate really a keyboard do, maestro actually. to fix that, right? Oh, 
<laughs> Sold. Okay. Yes, I will do that. Yeah. So, I mean, I was reading a story this past week about how uh, Facebook employees were no longer proud to be Facebook employees, where where it was a sort of a mark of shame to be seen wearing a, a Facebook jacket or Facebook sweater or, right. or backpack because of the. And you know what? Tough. You you know who you work for. You know exactly what's going on there. And we 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 saw this most recently with the uh, the Wi-Fi and VPN thing, where they would convinced people to sign up for a VPN and given all their traffic to Facebook and paid them for it, breaking the uh, the agreements that they have for enterprise distribution. In fact, I say most recently, and it's almost impossible to keep track anymore what's most recent because they do this thing every other week. I mean, I, I, I want to be careful. Enough. I'm happy to Enough. knock a company that's doing things that are untoward. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily follow that you're knocking the people who work there. I mean, on the one hand, I think generally people are good. But also, you may have no option but to carry on in that job. Companies companies are made up of people. These decisions are made at the companies. And you can you can support them or, you know, you can do like Google where they all yeah. walked out. There, there are things that... At some point, you have to say, this is not a reasonable thing. This should not have happened and decide whether or not you want to be a part of it I or just, put a stop to I'm it. I'm very conscious of I, the I, economic I, pressures on people to stay longer than they might I, want. But. I agree. I understand that also. But the, I, I don't think there's any defending any one of these incidents and continually saying, oh, just check your settings. Users can manage it in their settings. This was unintentional. How many of these things have to happen before it stops looking like unintentional? Very importantly, I need to throw in now that you can't do that settings thing through Siri shortcuts, uh, but you can post on Facebook via Siri shortcuts. So I can at least automatically post my complaint about the sounds coming back. There you go. Right. Yeah. Right. Now, Facebook, because it's a story about Facebook, Facebook did a couple of things, right? Facebook has this portal device. Portal is a camera with facial recognition that can follow you around as you move about and uh, is meant to be a communications device, right? Um, vaguely, yes. Yeah, yeah so they, they launched this thing and they have discounted it to $99. So if you want to have Facebook recognizing your face in your home, you can have one for 99 bucks. Okay, well, everybody's got to have a hobby. Um, what's the advantage to me? Yeah, and... The, the the reason I bring it up is because Facebook are working to develop their own AI oh, assistant. Yes. yes. So instead of just running Alexa on it as it is today, they want to turn it into a Facebook artificial intelligence assistant. So instead of saying, hey, Facebook or OK, Facebook, whatever, I could just give the camera a funny look and it would know I was talking to it. That could be OK. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. 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 That's that's all I got. I'm burned out on Facebook. I'm burned out on some of this stuff, but I am hotly anticipating a brand new iPhone for 2019. I think that's going to be incredible. Right. I want one of those. I'm still in hock for the 2018 one, so yeah. But yeah, that was my choice. There we go. I do love there it. There we go. So. Yep. All right. Well, where can we find you I on the internet? Usually, be found lurking. Uh, on Twitter as W Gallagher, but I'm always on the end of email at William at Apple dot com, where the password is. Um, oh, it's just slipped my mind. Yeah. Uh, how about you? <laughs> and I'm Victor. I'm at V Marks on Twitter. I'm Victor at Apple Insider dot com. And William is my best friend. I'm so glad you're able to make it to this day and, and spend this time with us. I enjoy doing this. Thank you. All right. We will be back next week. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.